Hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, welcome to this uh, this first uh, Hellion virtual book launch event. We uh, we decided that uh, since the uh, the conference a few weeks ago uh, was such a success that we'd try and use this platform again to do the sort of thing that in an ideal world we'd be uh, we'd be doing in the flesh. Uh, I can see already from the chat that we've uh, we've had the same advantage as we had with the conference that uh, we have people chiming in from all over the world, which is uh, great to see. Um, We've got 50 odd people registered and it's currently telling me there are 29 of you in the audience. Um, I'm conscious that Demio can sometimes leave a bit of a queue for people to get in. So if you'll forgive me while I just waffle slightly for a few minutes more just to uh, just to kick things off and uh, and hopefully let a few more people join before we get into the, uh, the meat of the thing. Uh, for those of you who um, uh, aren't familiar with uh, with Demio before? Uh, I'm familiar with Demio. I haven't used it before. Um, it, it, it's entirely uh, a browser based, as as you should know. You haven't had to download anything to uh, enable yourselves to get on here. That does mean it is dependent on your browser uh, and your internet connection. So uh, it's possible that you 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 if you have any trouble, uh, you may need to refresh your uh, refresh your browser or possibly even switch to a different one if you have an alternative. Uh, it, it seems to respond particularly well to Chrome. Uh, so if, if you're having trouble and you have Chrome installed, consider dropping out and rejoining with uh, with, with a different browser. Uh, that, that's one thing that uh, that can often help. Uh, if you have persistent problems, there's, there's not an awful lot we can do at, at a remove, but of course everybody will get a video of the event. So if you do find that you've missed a little bit of things, um, that there, there will be the opportunity to uh, to listen afterwards uh, and the only thing you'll miss out on there is the uh, is the chat um it's already been overtaken by uh people introducing themselves and I, I will keep reposting this uh obviously if this were a real book launch we would be making the book available at a discount uh we can't do that in the flesh but we we have we have provided a discount code uh that will enable you to um buy the book from Hellion website with 15% off. So if you haven't already bought it with the uh, the introductory offer that we launched it with, uh, you can uh, you can make use of that code either today or tomorrow uh, and, and do that. I'll, I'll post that up again in a moment um, when the uh, the event's underway. So the format for tonight, um, I shall be uh, handing over in a moment to, uh, to Rob Griffith, uh, who is the author of uh, uh, at the point of the bayonet, which is the title that we're uh, that we're launching tonight, uh, and obviously he's the man that you've uh, that you've all come to hear, rather than uh, listening to me waffle on. Um, he's going to talk for about 25-30 minutes. Um, we'll then have a uh, a Q and A session at the end. Um, obviously, you guys don't get to uh, don't get to speak with this platform, so please please post your. Uh... Oh, thank you for somebody. Somebody's reshared the code for me. Lovely, very kind. Um, people. Uh... Um, if people can post uh, questions as they occur to them in the uh, in the chat, um, the the behind the scenes wizardry enables me to tag them as questions, and then I can pull them out at the end uh, and ask them on behalf of you all uh, to to round off the evening. Um, so that's uh, that's basically it, really, as to how it's worked, uh, how it's going to work. Uh, I can see we're getting more people in. Um, I think, to be honest, people are probably going to join by now if they're going to. So we'll uh, we'll, we'll think about getting underway. Um, I'd like, therefore, to uh, introduce uh, Rob Griffith and ask him to uh, turn his uh, uh, camera and microphone on and join me on the uh, on the stage, as it were. Um, for those of you who, who haven't encountered him before, Rob, Rob is uh, the historian uh, and, and the reenactor. He uh, uh, wrote his first title for Hellion uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Rifleman, on the history of the 50th, 60th in the, in the uh, uh, Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, uh, which was uh, was very well received. He's uh, he's now gone on to write the second title uh, on uh, on two of Hill's battles that we're, we're about to hear hear about. I'm also pleased to say, as those of you who will, uh, were at the conference will know, that he's also joined me on the editorial team for the series uh, and is, uh, is looking after several of the titles as we continue to expand the, uh, uh, the output in, uh, from Reason's Revolution. So uh, without further ado, I shall shut up and I shall, uh, I shall let the man himself take over uh, and tell us all about Ira Molinos uh, and El Moraz. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. 
Can you uh, put the slides up, please, Andrew? Thank you. So um, tonight I'm going to take you a little tour around the battlefields of uh, Arimalinos and Almaraz. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, to go there while writing the book. Uh, it's a lovely area. Um, but uh, before we start uh, looking at uh, the pictures, let's have a look at um, a bit of background. So the year is 1811 and the Peninsula War has been going on for three years, and it's uh, it's degenerated into a bit of a stalemate, really. Um, the French um, can't um, join all their armies and defeat Wellington and the Portuguese army, and you know his Anglo-Portuguese Anglo army. Uh, to, to do that, then the Spanish forces will, will uh, take back lots of territory, and likewise, Wellington hasn't got the manpower to to de uh, defeat the French. So for m most of 1811, um, there was, you know, obviously significant battles um, like Albuera and, and, and Franco uh, Adenoro, but basically the, the situation didn't change. Um, Wellington occupied, uh, um, was most occupied in the uh, northern area of uh, Portugal around Almedia and uh, Ciudad de Rodrigo. And he left the southern flank to Roland Hill with a uh, his second division and a division of Portuguese soldiers. And also uh, some significant uh, Spanish allies. To the east of Hill was uh, Salt and his French army. And the area in between the, the, the Spanish province of uh, Extremadura was basically fought over all year, and there's you know, some towns that, that traded hand three or four times. And the main reason for this, you know, constant changing of hands was that the French and the Spanish armies um, both needed to gain resources from the area. So the French would come into a town, raise some taxes, um, confiscate some, some grain or whatever food they needed and then retreat as the, the Spanish or the um, Anglo-Portuguese army advanced towards them. The Spanish would then do the same thing. And this, these poor towns would, would change hands, as I said, and pay taxes to both armies, you know, several times uh, during the year. And, you know, it was a dance that Hill and Salt played a lot. You know, um, the, the, the aims of, of each general was, was not to, to, to bring, you know, the other to a battle. Um, it, you know, basically, they were both ho holding holding their front while more important um, things went, went on elsewhere. And so towards the end of September in 1811, um, the Spanish were occupying the town of, of Caceres, which is there in the centre of the map. And it's one of the most uh, prosperous towns in the area. And then um, a French division commanded by uh, General Girard uh, advanced and forced the Spanish out. There was a slight skirmish, but, but no real fighting. And the Spanish retreated on, uh, onto the Portuguese border. And that was a problem for Wellington, because that meant that they couldn't, the Spanish couldn't raise any rations from you know, you know, Spain anymore, because they're not in Spain. And it meant that he would have to feed them. So he gave permission for Hill to advance towards Casares and force Girard out. And as I said, this kind of thing happened before or during the year. So Hill, uh, who's, who is headquartered in uh, Porto Alegre, uh, there on the uh, left of the map, uh, gathered his second division and part of the Portuguese division and began to advance towards Casares. This was in um, towards the end of October. And you know, whilst you know, we think of Spain, a lot of us, as a lovely place to go on holiday, nice and sunny, um, the weather in October can get appalling, and there is lots of wind and rain, and the troops advanced for several days through Portland, where the, 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 some of the guns had to be left behind because the roads were too bad. And so they advanced um, through Albuquerque and Alcida and Malpartita Mar towards Caceres. And Girard you know, knew they were coming, and he did a sensible thing, and he uh, began to retreat south towards Montanches, 
And then he spent the night in Arianolinos. And he didn't really, you know, again, because the weather was, was poor and he thought it was quite safe. He didn't advance very far or very fast. And he ended up in, in, in the village of Arianolinos. Now, once Hill realized that he'd, he'd stayed, he'd stopped there, um, Hill decided that if he pushed his men for one final forced march, he could close, you know, on Girard and bring them to battle. And this is what not not what he expected to do at, at the beginning of the operation. He, he expected, you know, them to just play out the usual dance. But he decided to push his men really hard in really poor weather, even though they'd already marched over 100 miles um, in like four or five days. And so he got to the village of Alsuskar um, on the 27th of October. You can see the route of the march there. So uh, Alkiskar is only uh, two, about two miles from Arimalinos. So this is the view um, from the road uh, to, to Alkiskar towards Arimalinos. Now uh, you can see the church there and that's where the, the, the centre of the old village is. And this area here was all heavily forested and so on the night of the 27th um, British and Portuguese and Spanish soldiers had advanced to, through the forest over really bad roads uh, there were delays because a, a, a gun got stuck in a ditch and that sort of thing and again it was awful weather and they got to this area uh, which is just um, about half a mile uh, from the village and it's a low hill and Hill gathered his troops here and uh, he was quite surprised that they hadn't encountered any um, French pickets um, everything was still quiet and it was um, you know first thing in the morning dawn was breaking and as I said it wasn't nice and sunny um, it was raining very hard and there's a quote from the CO of the uh, 92nd Gordon Highlanders saying it was, a, it was the worst morning for wind and rain that you can remember and yeah that's quite something coming from a Scot. So first thing in the morning um, the Spanish uh, sorry the, 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 the Spanish advanced around the side of the village and it was the 92nd Gordon Highlanders and the 71st uh, Highland Light Infantry who were tasked with going into the village. So you can see the, street, the village streets here are very narrow. Um, one piece of advice, never follow your sat-nav into a Spanish village. Um, I, I did the, you know, my first day there, you know, the, the route took me through one of these villages. I had to fold in the wing village to get through some of these streets. It's a bit of a nightmare. So if you can imagine, you know, eight or nine hundred hairy Scotsmen playing the bagpipes, running through this first in the morning. Um, as you can imagine, it's a bit of a rude awakening for the French. Um, the, um, the, uh, the pipers in the 92nd uh, chose uh, the song, uh, Hey Johnny, Are You Waking Yet? Uh, with a nice bit of irony. So the French were pretty much completely surprised. There was, there was, there was there were very, but, uh, not enough pickets. The 92nd went straight up the main street. Uh, the 71st looped around along with the company of the 60th, looped around the village um, to come in th through a different entrance. But that's it. This is where the 71st and the, and the 60th um, came, came into the village. And very soon um, the French were retreating up this hill uh, away from the village. One brigade of the, the, the French division had already left. Uh, but there was a brigade of cavalry and a brigade of infantry um, who were basically very quickly overrun. The cavalry uh, had an action uh, with the Spanish um, first and then, then some British cavalry as well and were basically routed. Um, the French inf infantry tried to um, make a stand uh, just at, outside the village here and they formed square because of the cavalry and that enabled the Portuguese artillery that was with Hill's force to do some really you know, bad damage to them. 
Um, then the 92nd and 71st um, formed line and began firing volleys. And basically the, the French infantry brigade just disintegrated and ran for the hills. And the problem with, the problem Girard had gotten, in, you know, got himself into was that there were these very large hills behind the village. And, he, you know, so he, he, the French troops were, um, the French troops were aiming to loop around the base of the hills uh, on, the, on the right of the screen. And the 92nd and 71st had been joined by the 50th foot, and they were pursuing the French. But round their flank came another British brigade, uh, the 28th, 34th, and 39th, uh, again with the company of the 60th. And the light company for that brigade cut off Girard's retreat. So Girard could not go um, the route he wanted around the hills, and his men began to run basically up the hills. Now this is the kind of um, um, terrain that's there now, and it's basically the same as it was. Um, the, the area is mostly cork and olive trees with dry stone walls. And you really couldn't ask for a better defensive position, all these boulders and dry stone walls. But what always surprised me was how few uh, British casualties there were. I think there were seven dead or something. Um, so the, the French didn't really put up much of a fight. Um, and they ran over those hills. Um, the, uh, a Spanish brigade under Brigadier uh, Murillo uh, uh, looped round the hills on, uh, uh, to the left of the screen. And then the, um, the Spanish and the 39th foot especially, and some light dragoons basically pursued the French for about another 20 miles. Um, at the end of the day, Girard had about 50 or 100 men with him a lot of wounded and that was the only sort of intact unit that, that survived the rest of the brigade there's something like 1300 prisoners taken um so you know Gerard's division was, was basically and decimated um there's some you know quite amusing stories the um the 34th foot on the british side met the 34th foot uh or the 34th of the line on the french side and there was just you know sort of uh, friendly greetings between the two sets of officers because of the same number. Um, there is apparently, somewhere in those hills, a French eagle buried. Um, there was certainly a French eagle that was lost, it wasn't captured. And uh, uh, I, met, um, I met someone in a village who was sort of uh, doing a bit of a tour around, and she said there's a, there's a guy who comes down from Madrid every year um, on his holidays with a, with a metal detector hoping to find that eagle. So, So this is the, the back side of the hill. So this is the area that the, the French were shooting over. So it, it, once you get over the, the first set of hills, it comes into a bit of a plain, and then there's more hills. Um, and as I said, the, the pursuit you know, took about uh, you know, the rest of the day. And uh, it basically you know, only finished when the 39th foot just were too exhausted you know, to carry on. But it's a lovely little village. Uh, it's worth visiting if you if you are in the area. Um, although it is still you know a very um, overlooked area of Spain, very quiet. Um, you know, there are very few English speakers, so uh, my uh, schoolboy Spanish had to come to the fore. But uh, it's a lovely area and well worth well visiting. So that's Ari Molinos. Um, so after Arimelinos, um, Hill was very widely praised um, you know, for the action. Um, it came at the end of a, of a difficult year, so from a propaganda point of view and a morale point of view, it was a very useful victory. I and mean, strategically, it wasn't particularly important, um, you know, um, but it was, as I said, a big morale raiser. The second division. Uh, got the nickname the surprises uh, you know, uh, um, and for surprising the, uh, the French and Hill got a knighted, got a knighted out of it he became Sir Roland Hill uh, but after, after that for most of the winter um, it went back to the same old dance of the French advancing um, 
the Anglo-Portuguese force countering and then the French retreating again. So that happened um, over the winter. But as uh, 1812 began, um, Wellington had great plans for the year. He wanted to take both the fortresses of Ciudad Rodrigo and Badajoz. And part of his plan um, was to destroy a bridge at Almaraz, which basically connected the French army in the south to the French army in the north. Um, if he could cut that bridge, then Sultz could not advance north to, to help the armies in, you know, there, and the armies in the north could not you know, uh, um, come south. So he, he outlined in great detail some plans to, to build the bridge at Almaraz. And unfortunately, um, there was an officer uh, sent forward uh, to do a recce of the site um, in um, the start of the year. And the, the, he discovered that the, the bridge had been taken up because the, the, the river Targus was in flood. And so the, the bridge had been taken up so they couldn't destroy it because it was on the wrong side of the bank. So the plan was shelved. And Wellington went on to take uh, the seat of the in January and then, then um, about a horse in April. But once he'd done that, he then wanted to advance into Spain and he still needed the bridge destroyed. So in May, uh, he sent Hill to destroy the bridge. Hill used basically a subset of the same troops he'd used for, for, for Ari Molinos, um, you know, part of, his, part of his second division. Uh, plus some Portuguese troops. And they advanced from the town of Alamandrejo Alan at, at the bottom of the map, deep into, in, uh, deep into uh, uh, French territory, past, uh, um, past Arimelios, um, and to the, the crossing. So this is the old bridge at Almaraz, which was um, destroyed in 1809 by the Spanish. And this is, a, unless, unless looking um, east from that bridge, you can see there's no real suitable crossing point there, mountains all the way down to the river. But this is the looking down to where the crossing was. It was basically a pontoon bridge made of boats with planks um, over the top. And it was basically the first viable crossing point um, on the Targus you know, um, in that area. The French had fortified both the approaches and the position. Um, you can see just on the map there's um, Fort Raguse and Fort Napoleon. Um, so they were protecting the bridge and there was a, um, a, a earthwork around the bridge as well. And then on the main approach from the south, um, you can see there's a Fort Colbert um, and the um, position around um, the fort at, fort at, at Miravet. So that basically blocked the main approach for guns. So, so Hill arrived um, on the 17th of May and his first thought was to try and take that pass and so he, he, he sent some troops uh, for a night attack. They got a bit lost because it's a very rough terrain and they tried to take that position. You can see so you can see on the left, on the peak, that's where one of the forts was. The flat area in the middle screen uh, of the slide, there was another fort there. And uh, down near the trees on, on the right, there was a fortified inn uh, as well, which, which was covering the road. So it's quite a formidable, formidable um, uh, place to try and storm, especially at night. And the, you can see that's a contemporary drawing made at the time. We can see what they faced. Now this is looking down from the peak uh, to, to where the fortified inn was and where Hill's guns would have to travel down to the bridge which is on the uh, uh, sort of far left. And this is a slope which a uh, force under General Tilson Chown uh, tried to attack at night. Unfortunately, um, as the uh, British force um, gathered, um, they were discovered 
so the French sentries were alerted. The French started, you know, uh, a strong fire from the, uh, from the forts, and the attack abandoned. With one surprise, we lost. Uh, it's too, it's too, um, too impregnable a, a position. Really. So Hill retreated back down the road. You can see there, um, towards, towards the central top of the screen, and tried to try and reassess what to do. He could either try and force the pass again, or he could try and go round. Go round. And what he decided to do in the end uh, was to do a uh, on the nineteenth uh, to do a mock attack on the pass again to occupy the French, and then to come down via some very other steep hills. Um, the goat tracks they were using was, was so narrow that they had to cut the scaling ladders in half to get them around the corners. But they eventually uh, arrived at this position, which is looking down towards the crossing to see the, the blue of the river there. And the area uh, in the centre, sort of flat area, slightly um, lighter brown, is where Fort Napoleon was. So this is the remains of Fort Napoleon. It's quite a um, strong little fort, um, manned by, by uh, three or four hundred men, and with ditches uh, along the front. The sides are very steep, and there is a, a tower in, in one of the corners. Hill and his men arrived uh, just after dawn. They wanted to get there before dawn, but the route was so difficult that they were you know, delayed. And um, Hill divided his attacking force into three columns to take the fort. So uh, one wing of the 50th attacked, the, attacked this area, uh, another attacked the, the front of the fort, and half of the 71st, uh, Highland Light Infantry, uh, attacked the other side, whilst the rest of the, rest of the Highlanders and the 92nd uh, went to attack the bridge itself. You can see they are quite substantial walls. Um, this is the area where a uh, captain and, and candler of the uh, 50th uh, mounted a ladder, waved his sword, urged his men on, and then got shot and, and fell into the um, and fell into the fort. So there were substantial casualties amongst the, the 50th foot. Um, you, 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 you were the ones you know, first into the fort. Now this is the site of, uh, of the crossing. Um, the buildings on the uh, right, the, the little cottages, um, um, they were, that was an inn, and again, that was fortified into a, a, a storeroom and a position. Um, there was a, a tector pond, uh, which is basically a sort of open, open, open sided earthwork back where I'm taking that shot from, but there's no trace of it now. There's a derelict hotel. Um, uh, which is back where I was taking a um, photograph from. The bridge actually ran from that little, those set of changing rooms or something, they, uh, or cafe or something, um, there, and they ran across to the other side. Um, fort the Goose, the other fort was just on the crest of that hill across the river. The river is wider than it, uh, than it was at the time, because there's, there's been dams um, downstream, so it's about a quarter or a third wider than it was. So that's a quick little tour of the battlefields. Um, I'm obviously more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Sure, that was an excellent tour. I'll uh, a bit of a time lag with the camera, Clint. <laughs> Didn't need to leave you. Uh, right. Okay, we've had quite a few questions. I'll uh, I'll go through them for, for the benefit of anybody who might be uh, be watching on the uh, the recording afterwards, uh, who won't get to see the chat. I'll I'll read I'll read them out uh, as well as bring them up on the uh, the screen. So let's bear with me a moment. Um, looking back, first of all, then to uh, Aaron Molinos, uh, a question from. Uh, Hayden, who asks, uh, am I correct in thinking that the Battle of Naramalinas was unusual in being uh, neither open country nor a siege? Um, no, I'd say. Um, certainly, 
in terms of major battles, then yeah, if you're looking at Salamanca or Badajoz, then yes, they fall into one of those categories. But I think what, what's, what gets overlooked is that there are a lot of more minor actions, you know, uh, El Bodon, things like that. Um, I will, um, where actually it wasn't a, you know, um, a siege or open country, it was something in between. There were loads of you know, um, skirmishes that um, um, you know, took part, so known, basically. Yeah, exactly. If Fuentes were the foot, there was, it was the, the yeah the answer that jumped to my mind as well when uh, when that was asked. But uh, thank you. Uh, have we any more? I'm trying trying to do one battle at a time rather than jumping between them, which just means scrolling through the questions to make sure I don't uh, I don't miss anything. Um, well, I, I guess this could apply to both of them actually. But uh, I think I think it was asked when you were still talking about uh, Aaron Molinos. Uh, you, you mentioned the the British units, but Anthony asks, uh, could I ask which Portuguese brigades were involved, uh, and was it just infantry? Um, there was Portuguese uh, artillery uh, battery, and it was um, it was uh, Ashworth's brigade with part of Hamilton's division. So off the top of my head, uh, no, no. <laughs> that's a look in the book. Sorry, sorry. So I, I can't quite remember the units, but it, it, it was um, part of the, um, it. So it was actually from part of Hamilton's. I think that's. Uh... All of the uh, Aromalina specific ones then. So moving on to uh, uh, Almaraz, um, two uh, asked simultaneously and effectively the same question. I'll, I'll, I'll bring James's up, but uh, and we have the same from Anthony. Uh, were the French thoughts uh, pre existing structures or were they constructed by the French during the campaign solely for, for this purpose? Uh, the thoughts at, uh, at Almaraz? The fort on the peak at Miravet was an old Moorish watchtower they improved um, and they also fortified a Venta or an inn there as well. Um, I think all the other ones were new constructions um, as far as I can tell. Um, so yeah, they're a mix basically. Uh, and just following on from that, actually, and I, I think this has partly been answered in the uh, in the chat. But uh, with respect to the the, the thoughts, uh, do, do the Spanish have an equivalent of the National Trust that looks after these monuments? Um, no, basically, uh, they, they may have, but these these were basically just on um, uh, on uh, private land. The, you know, especially the, the area around the actual crossing is all derelict. You know, there's one of the old. Um, storehouses there just literally full of rubbish, like six feet deep in rubbish. Um, so they're not particularly cared for. Um, the the fort on the peak is, is now a forest fire station, you know, one of those watch stations. Um, but most of the rest are just, you know, in, in open country. Just a, a rather specific one, just to clarify a point, uh, but uh, from Ian asking, uh, how wide would we estimate the Tagus is at Almaraz? Uh, 100 metres or less? Probably slightly less, probably 50 to 75, it varies slightly. Uh, certainly, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you, you need a bridge to cross it, you, know, you can't afford it, you know. I'm just looking through. I think we're down to just one last one in that case, which uh, I, I guess seems rather fitting as a, as, a, as, a, as a final question. Just thinking about the men who thought there from uh, Ian uh, who asks, uh, are, are there war graves near the villagers from the from the men who fell? Um, not official ones, no. I mean, obviously there, there would have been burials. Um, a significant number of French dead, dead and wounded were left. Um, and they would have to be buried somewhere, but there's no sign of them. Thank you. Um, I'll just. Uh, well, hang on. We've got, we've got sorry, another one here uh, in the uh, just going back to the switching between the questions and the uh, uh, and the chat. Uh, Claire asking about Almaraz. Uh, she did, I didn't catch uh, whether there was an original bridge, and if so, when was it destroyed? 
Yes, um, it was the um, it's called the Alabat Bridge, and um, I did show I did show a quick picture of it. Um, that was destroyed in 1809 by the Spanish to stop the French from from, from crossing. Um, so it wasn't repaired until after the war. I think there's a question from Bob Burnham as well. Uh, well yes, thank you. You're you're on the you're on the ball quicker than me. That's. Uh... <laughs> Uh, is there any evidence that the French tried to cut the Almaraz Bridge from the southern side to prevent Hill from capturing it? Uh, the French did cut the bridge during the attack. I'm not entirely sure it was to prevent Hill from capturing it, rather than to save their own skins. Um, the garrison on the north bank um, were from the 4th Etrangere Regiment, uh, what, had, what had been the Prussian Regiment, and uh, they basically legged it fairly quickly. And uh, so the bridge was cut, leaving a lot of the French on the wrong side of it. And uh, two grenadiers of the 92nd uh, swam over and, um, with a rope and, you know, basically uh, brought, the, um, brought, it, you know, brought the boats back over uh, so that the bridge could be repaired enough for Hill's men to, to cross and destroy all the forts. Um, because they, you know, spent a lot of time destroying the forts, burning the bridge. Uh, unfortunately, there was a, a, a lieutenant of the KGL artillery who managed to burn himself up instead of blowing the fort up, which was very nice. Um, and so there was one casualty well after the battle, um, but they did manage to destroy all, almost everything. Oh, we have. I've got to wrap up. We have another one. Um... Um, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Keep them coming, people. If uh, we ask any more, we've. Uh, we've uh, yes. Uh, yes. Well, for the benefit of the people on the, on uh, the recording, Rob, if I could just uh, do it first. Uh, sure. Are the locals generally aware of the battle taking place there? And I take it the village didn't suffer much damage. We so often read about villages being destroyed. Uh, yeah, Aaron Melinos are um, very keen on their, their, their claim to fame. Really, um, they have an annual uh, reenactment. Um, uh, and you know, the, I, I was invited into the town hall, and they have you know, paintings of the battle on the walls and this type of thing. Uh, but there's a little tourist office there, which has some information about it as well. Um, so now I'm in the office, yes, um, but Almaraz is in the middle of nowhere. Um, but generally, there's a very active um, a reenactment scene in Spain. For them, it's their, their war of independence. Um, so you know, there was, and you know, in Portugal as well, you know, they are, you know, as well remembered as our civil war battles are in, in the UK or the American civil war in, in the US. Uh, the village did not suffer significant damage, uh, as far as I know, and the fighting basically went through it very, uh, very quickly, and uh, yeah, most of the artillery firing was 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 outside of, uh, outside of the village. It's building I'm getting, I'm getting questions uh, left, right, and centre. And I need to mark them all up. Uh, just following on from that one, can can you recommend a good base for touring the battles in this part of the country? Um, well, I haven't, I haven't travelled extensively in the area. I, I basically went over just to these two battle sites, you know, and. Anyone who's ever written a book knows you don't earn much money from it, so my budget was was fairly constrained. Um, yeah, so I did as everything as quickly as I could. Um, I'm hoping to be back there, you know, uh, next year or maybe the year after. I'd probably say um, you're looking, probably looking at Elvas or, or Badajoz, uh, you know, as a good base for, for, for that part of the country. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll say to you one question just to, uh, about the book since I, I can answer it as well as anybody uh, asking does it include order, an order of battle and maps so that the war, make, war gamer may recreate it and uh, yes of course it does so that's uh, that's absolutely fine if you're uh, intending to use it for uh, for those purposes um, oh and some advice from a local uh, Cascares or Theodore Rodrigo would actually be more convenient for uh, anybody in the chat but uh, <laughs> Um, so more questions. Um, 
Do we know how many, sorry, how many, if any, French guns were captured at Almaraz, and how long did the French, how long did the Second Division stay at the position? This is one, this one from Alan. Um, there is a inventory uh, that's in the book of everything that was captured, uh, including loads of cows and rations and loads. Of, I, I haven't got the figures to hand, but they were captured and they were all blown up because you know Hill did not have enough you know um, transport to you know to bring in anything away so they were uh, basically loaded and pointed at each other and, and fired or spiked or you know otherwise blown up the uh, division stayed there basically uh, overnight they left the next morning Uh, and another one from uh, from Anthony. What what is your opinion, Rob, of uh, of Hill as a commander? Um, I love the guy, really. To be honest, <laughs> he's you know um, he's got this reputation uh, for being kind to the men. You know, Daddy Hill um, is, is his nickname. But I, I think there's a lot more to him than that. And you know, part of the reason I wrote the book was that I think in these two battles he shows a lot of drive and determination and daring. You know, um, uh, you know, in both battles, you know, he pushed his men, you know, to get the job done. And, you know, certainly in terms of uh, at, uh, at Ariel Molinos, no one would have criticised him if he just let Gerard march away. Um, at Almaraz, the original plan was to attack it, supported by um, artillery. But the, the blocking of the pass by the French, and he couldn't get his artillery there. So he just decided to, you know, take it by, you know, uh, at the point of the bayonet um, and, and risk his men's life. So he was, he both cared for his men, but was, you know, a good enough general to, uh, to, get, to get the job done that needed to be done. And another one from uh, Ian, I think, uh, did any of the locals take the opportunity to slaughter French soldiers once they were broken? I'm presuming that one relates to uh, Aaron Molinos. There is uh, one of the accounts talks of marching out of Ari Melinos and um, it's a British officer's account and he's basically saying that, that, that he pitied the French who'd left behind because the, the, you know, the, the locals were all getting, ready, you know, all getting their knives out ready. Um, obviously, you know, most of the French were, uh, were captured and uh, if they could walk, um, they were led away. But I think there, there were some wounded there who uh, probably didn't survive very long. Thank you. Uh, so we're still getting travel advice in the chat, which is great clearly for anybody uh, wanting to uh, plan a visit. So lots of uh, lots of local expertise uh, being deployed there. I don't see any more questions unless uh, I've missed one. Uh, no, we've got praise for riflemen now, but no more questions. So I think we're probably about ready to wind things up. Again, Rob, for uh, the presentation and for uh, for answering everything, that's really really appreciated. I I, I feel like this has been a uh, a success as the first of these uh, these launches. Um, we're sticking with the Peninsula War for the next one. It'll be a week today. Um, uh, Tom Scotland talking about his recent biography of uh, uh, Dr. McGregor. So looking at the medical side of the uh, of the war, uh, I hope we'll see some of you again for uh, for that. Uh, again, there'll be a, a discount code. Um, I've uh, I've put up the one for uh, this again. I'll pop it up again a final time in case anybody's uh, missed it. Um, telling that though, um, I'll, I'll I'll leave the chat going for a little while longer so people can uh, can check the code. Uh, but I think otherwise we'll uh, we'll we'll bid you bid you adieu. Uh, close things down. I'll, I'll give it a couple more minutes uh, and then we'll uh, we'll end the session. So thank you very much, Rob. That's been uh, been a great start to these uh, these events. Thank you.